happy to welcome Molly Hunger and Cal Miller back to AUD. Uh, they're both alumni of the department, and since they graduated, they have uh, both gone to do important work in other institutions and through their practices and uh, research endeavors. Um, uh, Molly Hunker is assistant professor at the Syracuse University School of Architecture and the co-captain of the award-winning practice sports with Greg Corso. I, I love the co-captain thing, more people <laughs> should adopt that. Um, their work combines research, practice and teaching. Uh, they are the recipients of the 2017 Architectural League Prize from the Architectural League of New York, the 2018 Young Architects Award from the Architects Newspaper, and the 2017 and 2020 ACSA Faculty Design Award. Their bias are much, much longer, but the con there are two, and the conversation is going to be long, so I try to um, uh, extract some highlights. Cal Miller is also faculty at Syracuse. He's associate professor and currently serving as associate dean. As co-founder of Possible Mediums, Cal has curated various exhibitions, events, and publications. His research has been supported by the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, and also by Syracuse University, and has been included in the AIA Emerging Professionals exhibition and show at the A-Plastic Museum here in uh, Los Angeles, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University, the Yale School of Architecture, uh, among many others. In addition to the Boswell Mediums publication, his work has also been included in Log, Mono, Constructs, Pitchkin, uh, Project off from that Room 1000, and the Journal for Architecture Education. Um, today's event focuses on a publication that either you have read or you can purchase in the uh, back desk. Uh, it's titled Building Practice uh, that Molly and Cal have uh, co-edited. The format for the event is a little bit different than other book launches that we have done in the department uh, before. Um, Cal and Molly propose to include both some of the faculty that are included in the publication uh, and myself in the conversation, but more importantly, to invite three of our students to act as moderators. In the role, organizing the discussion in itself is an act of curation and a form of response to the content and the structure of the book. I understand that you have used these formats with a lot of success in previous events. So Katie Angen, Cam Jones, and Anna Wittel have uh, kindly accepted to take on uh, the role, and you will hear from them after Molly and Carl's presentation. So thank you, Katie, Cam, and Anna for joining us. Uh, my small contribution to frame the event in its capacity to impact pedagogy and practice uh, not only the practices that all of you will go on to either join or create by yourselves, but the practices that also our faculty are uh, currently leading, is that the framework for the Building Practice book makes it effective both as a curated survey and in the organization and foregrounding of themes that impact our architectural lives beyond practice. Um, and this would include the work that all of you are doing now at the school as students, the work that we all do as researchers, as educators, in leaderships, uh, in leadership positions, and also in our labs and in our offices. So ultimately, the book has gathered voices across a generation of architects that find the common ground in how they navigate a shifting territory for being an architect in the world today, uh, offering a blueprint for a type of intellectual that has strong roots in both academia and in practice. While the book represents a diverse collection of projects and ideas, all practices included have an enormous impact in architectural discourse and slowly but surely are also transforming the built environment. Um, like the title suggests, a practice is something that we build and by extension, something that we have to design. So it is too like pedagogy, a project. Um, I will now pass it on to Molly and Kyle, so please join me in welcoming them back to AED. Thanks so much, Mariana, and thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Kyle and I are so thrilled to be back here, the place where we were trained, um, and to share this project with all of you. Um, so Kyle and I just want to give a sort of short introduction, maybe 20 minutes, about the project, sort of overview of the book, um, and then have a conversation with, um, with all of the contributors. So in 2018, Kyle and I were working on an exhibition at Syracuse University on the status of practice at that moment. 
Kyle and I envisioned that exhibition as a collaboration between a group of young practices and our Syracuse students as a way for the students to learn how young experimental design practices come into being and sustain themselves. So we created a seminar that we imagined as a kind of alternative professional practice meets contemporary design culture education. After the exhibition was ultimately canceled because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the project expanded. Second year of the seminar, another group of practices interviewed, and eventually the development of the book that we're launching tonight, which is made up of a total of 32 edited interviews, 12 short texts on the important issues that emerged from those interviews, and an introduction to provide a context for all of it. While an equal collaboration in writing, editing, and curating, Kyle's and my roles in this project are quite different. My interest in this effort has been from the inside out. My role is that of fellow practitioner, someone who is also building a practice with many of the same pressures, constraints, requirements, et cetera, as many of the practices interviewed for the book. As Maria, Mariana mentioned, I have a practice called Sports with Greg Corso, in which we primarily focus on small interventions in the public realm. And I was interested in exploring and documenting the practical matters associated with running a practice and business. As we start and grow our own practices, whether as a recent graduate wanting to do their own thing, moving on to a new uh, venture mid-career, or the growth and development of critical academic work into physical built projects, there are many practical questions that come up. How do we get clients whose values hopefully align with ours? Do we hire employees? Do we rent office space? How are we good contractors found in places where we have never worked before? These can be frustrating topics to work through. How are we supposed to be experts at design and also somehow know about law, code, policy, marketing, and promotion, among many other things, despite the small amount of professional practice preparation provided by a single required course in architecture school, or what we glean from working in another firm. No offense. <laughs> Kyle's interest in this work is, uh, was at that time and is still different. As an academic administrator, curator, critic, and convener, Kyle has long been interested and invested in larger trends in architecture, an ever-evolving situating of who the players are, what kind of work they do, how they came to be, and how they are changing in relation to the people and context around them. With his role in this project, Kyle was interested in revealing the ways in which our cultural and environmental context is affecting the work of young practices and what it may mean for the future of the discipline. For Kyle, the project was also an opportunity to assess the meanings produced in the first acts of a group of young designers and thinkers' careers, and also speculate on subsequent actions and the limitations of these practices given the territories and themes they operate within and on. Kyle's and my differing perspectives as editors hopefully create a broader audience for the book, logistically helpful for students and fellow practitioners, while also situating itself within a larger disciplinary trajectory. Um, the book is very much not a manifesto of the way in which we should practice, but rather an attempt at atomizing the idea of practice to mean many things at once. The message we want to communicate to readers, particularly younger and student readers, is that practice is multiple, architecture is multiple, and we can all do things differently with the ambition to make a lasting and positive impact on the world. Before I turn it over to Kyle, I'd like to make a few acknowledgments. Um, the process of developing all the content that I just mentioned into the actual physical artifacts of the book was really a delight due to the superstar graphic designer and copy editor collaborators, um, Kat Wentworth and Jane Kelly, respectively. They're so good at what they do, and it's really fun to work with people like that. I'd also like to acknowledge the thoughtful and intelligent work of the students of our building practice seminars, um, too many to name right now, though they're obviously included in the book. Um, we truly could not have done this project without them. And I think it affected the fact that they were the ones interviewing most of the practices really affected the way that people answered the questions, often with more honesty and transparency, which really made this project what it is. Um, thank you also to Syracuse University um, and Dean Speaks for the financial support without which this book could not have been possible. I um, want to thank Architectural Research and Design for publishing the book. And finally, to Mariana and the AUD for hosting us today.
away. Just to um, reiterate that, thank you, Kutan and Marianne. It's, um, I suspect I can speak for both of us here. It's very special to be here. We were in those seats for years watching people lecture here. Um, and to now uh, have an opportunity to do the same is uh, really wonderful. Um, we, in the remainder of our presentation, will try to present an overview of the introduction of the book, which really attempts to paint a picture for why the people profiled in the book might approach this act of building a practice in the way that they do. Um, and also the uh, kind of reveals the shared history that they have that also might um, provide insight into their values um, and the things that motivate them and that they find fulfilling. Um, so shrinking demand for new office and commercial space, rising building material costs, and a weakened housing sector effectively left the United States without a market for architectural services during the, the global economic downturn of the late aughts. Those who chose to weather the storm ended up facing a decade of uncertainty, and in most cases added responsibilities associated with teaching jobs that they took on to ensure a relatively stable source of income. Something that we'll, we'll uh, try to unpack in the panel discussion is this very condition. Perhaps unexpectedly, these designers, because of their comfort with risk, as well as the privilege of practicing with a leisurely approach to finding commercial success, uh, we think have positioned themselves amongst the most interesting individuals in architecture culture, uh, specifically in the United States today. Uh, evidence for this includes both the imaginative, aesthetic, and formal territories that they explore, as well as their ability to, to demonstrate the value of architecture in relation to today's most pressing societal concerns. And again, that's something that uh, we will revisit uh, during the panel discussion. So on the front end of this coming of age period for these designers and thinkers, the status of the discipline of architecture was being called into question by leading scholars, some uh, in this room. The introspective endeavors of successive generations of architects entertain the possibility that architecture could be pursued as an autonomous project with the expectation that their efforts would determine the conditions or output of the marketplace not be determined by it. In a piece titled Transdisciplinarity, theorist Mark Linder provided insight into this reactionary endeavor of recuperating disciplinary identity. Finding this nostalgic turn equally as problematic as calls for interdisciplinarity that diminished the specificity of architectural knowledge, Linder offered transdisciplinarity as a third approach to advancing architectural production. He declared, transdisciplinarity scrutinizes architecture's appearance, appearance in the forms of other disciplines or in the spaces in between disciplines, but in no way abandons specific modes of architectural production. Ultimately, Linder called for a simultaneous intensification and expansion of architecture's tools, techniques, and technologies as a means of demonstrating the flexibility of the identity of architecture as a discipline in practice. Uh, this is something we were just talking about before we began today, that the skill sets and the knowledge that students acquire while studying architecture is not uh, meant to only apply to the design and construction of buildings. Uh, and we truly believe that everyone that studied architecture is well prepared to do many things. Um, and I think this was a particular interest of Marx, but um, I've always liked the fact that he imagined that that skill set remained intensely focused on design. Um, so the years that followed coincided with a wave of alternative forms of architectural production, a combination of the slow economic recovery and allure of advancing architectural production in academic environments resulted in a generation of architects who formulated new approaches to practice through research and teaching. Additionally, as much as the Great Recession sponsored alternative approaches to practice, a shift nearly 10 years later was equally, equally dramatic and impactful. In 2017, with the inauguration of the 45th president and the administration's regressive and destructive policies towards climate change and social justice, a radical change in how individuals approached participating in architecture culture was initiated. Of course, throughout the history of architecture, there's been ebbs and flows, um, let's say, regarding the proximity that architecture has felt to, to politics and the way in which it uh, imagined itself as inherently political. It's not always the case. This increased urgency with which architecture culture needed to confront broader societal issues encouraged a moment of self-reflection, one akin to the inward turn of the late aughts. For this still emerging generation of architects, this pivotal moment made evident that their participation in constructing a more inclusive and sustainable future was necessary. And I think to the people that we've profiled in this book, those terms mean very different things um, to each of them individu individually. 
What followed and what is captured in this book was the development of approaches to praxis, praxis, practice that critically interrogate how architecture makes its appearance and seeks significance. Um, to that end, uh, building practice is an attempt to document continual states of becoming. It doesn't happen all at once. One objective is to reveal how an act of beginning initiates a body of work that seeks to produce no, new forms of architectural knowledge through various modes of production. In the book Beginnings, Edward Said set out to answer a seemingly simple question. What is a beginning? Said scrutinized what one must do to begin and what is special or unique about such a moment. He posited that the des designation of beginning is also the designation of consequent intention. I think that's also something that I'm particularly interested in is trying to unpack how what peers of mine are doing in real time really sets them on a path and constructs momentum that might not even be fully registered by them. He stated the beginning is the first step in the intentional production of meaning. Said unpacked the consequences of the act of beginning by suggesting that making a beginning simultaneously marks a difference from pre-existing traditions. I think one of the things that we're trying to do in this book is also acknowledge what's different from this generation uh, compared to previous generations. Um, not in the, for the purpose of creating divisiveness, but really to mark uniqueness. Uh, in keeping with this provocation, and this is something Molly mentioned earlier, the book is an occasion not to only assess the meanings produced in the first acts of these individuals, but also to open speculation on subsequent actions and limitations given the territories and themes in which they operate within and on. And I think by suggesting that, we're also suggesting that for a lot of these practices, certain things have been ruled out given what they've committed to thus far. So um, following the introduction, uh, and of course, after we conducted all of the interviews, Molly and I looked at what types of themes and topics recurred. Uh, and we tried to say something on behalf of all of the people with whom we spoke to individually, but um, tried to create these short reports that, um, again, really tried to mark territory and claim uniqueness uh, with which these people approach the construction of their own practice. The interviews in the book reveal strategies for linking practical and theoretical forms of knowledge and uncover how this generation is advancing speculative design through the culture and politics of building. Uh, also in the kind of double coded meaning of the title is the fact that a lot of these people were getting to build stuff for the very first time. Um, each of these short reports aspires to convene aspects of the individual interviews, reveal significant findings with respect to each issue and how they shape the interviewee's approach and articulate the collaborative construction of unique and unprecedented forms of practice. Building practice repositions, we hope this is the case, repositions a generation of architects more commonly associated with speculative or academic work as able and eager to make genuine contributions to the built environment uh, and while mending unnecessary divides between image making and activism, design and politics and academics and practice. I don't think anybody in the book would aggressively divide those things, although there, there will be a spectrum with which um, either side of, of those binaries might be approached. In drawing out the concerns that shaped the first acts of an emerging generation of designers and thinkers, building practice also reveals the per peripheral yet pivotal aspects of building a practice today. So the first topic that we'll call attention to is academia. And again, given the context in which we are currently in, um, this will also be something that's discussed during the panel discussion. To complement practice, almost every individual interviewed in this book also regularly teaches and conducts academic research. Research supported by academic institutions is a way to enhance professional efforts without concern for profitability. Likewise, teaching offers possibilities to work collaboratively with students on new intellectual or technical investigations that may not yet have a place in practice, uh, but perhaps ultimately aspire to show up in practice. Typically, architects who teach can practice in a more idealized way as a sociocultural act. There's a potential downside to this. Academic architects may feel less urgency to make names for themselves through building. I think that's also something that's particularly unique to the United, United States. While some embrace academic affiliation and situate practice as a secondary endeavor, others are distancing themselves from academia with an understanding that a successful commercial and cultural practice requires an elevated level of commitment. So clients. Um, there are new, numerous reasons why a young architect today may not want to or be able to wait around for the perfect commission from a perfect client. Many new practices certainly don't. 
design competitions, self-funded works, spec homes, grants, alternative funding models, and developer partnerships, among many other strategies, all play important roles in architectural practices first projects today. Emerging architects still design single family houses and small commercial projects, but more commonly, they're redefining and rethinking the meaning of client entirely. As practices, especially those with one foot in academia, move from research-oriented activities to operating as registered businesses, what is emerging is a complex convergence of sociopolitical values and strategic development. These intersections yield to calls by business strategists to create pipelines to manage future work and cultivate greater agency and control over the act of building the practice or risk going under. Aesthetics condition our experience of the built environment. Occasionally, distinctive aesthetics typify entire generations of architects who confront similar social and cultural circumstances. Uh, our read is that today, not only is there an absence of a shared ideologically driven aesthetic sensibility, uh, but that also exists within uh, individual practices, that there's an almost intentional lack of aesthetic coherence within individual bodies of work. Uh, to be determined, what is the effect of this disconnected, almost democratic aesthetic pursuits? And how does that affect their ability to remain culturally, culturally relevant, find commercial success, and sustain intellectual engagement? Rather than impose, impose fixed aesthetics, architects today understand the need for their aesthetic ambitions to broaden architectural discourse and reflect the condition in which the work is situated. The diversity of these architects animates equally diverse aesthetic arrays that sponsor inspiring forms of inclusivity. Today, architecture is almost exclusively a team sport. Collaborations are necessary for a project to be attentive and responsive to its sociopolitical context, sensitive to its environment, sustainable in its construction and ongoing maintenance, accessible to diverse constituents, sometimes less expensive and often more joyful all qualities that many younger architects are increasingly dedicated to pursuing. Regardless of their outputs, whether buildings, exhibitions, podcasts, business relationships, these collaborations focus more on the processes of exchange and interface among all of the voices and views of the contributors. Architecture is a new kind of exquisite corpse. Over time, this approach is likely to yield innovative strategies for architecture firms to establish and sustain themselves, creating new financial models, forms of cultural activity and community engagement, fabrication systems, and most importantly, inspiring and lasting contributions to the built environment. Cultural affiliations, demographics, environmental conditions, historical narratives, and social relations. Whether a designer intentionally sets them into dialogue or not, the physical context in which a project is situated is as much a part of that project as the designer's conceptual intentions. I think that's something that to many people would appear to be obvious, but again, like some of the other topics that we're covering, shifts over time quite dramatically. Ranging from surgical interventions in the public realm to large cultural venues or housing developments, the first built works of these architects exhibit a common trait an attentiveness to place that in part sponsors design. This engagement counters the dominant predilection architects had to impose personal ideology on a place without concern for its material or immaterial realities. Suggesting that critical interrogation of place will produce an informed result, these architects aspire for their work to acknowledge, address, and enliven the complexities of contemporary life. The question of whom architects are talking to through their work becomes a critical one as an office develops and grows. Is communication with clients the most important because it enables a project to get built? Or is the builder more important so that the project is executed with the highest possible level of craft and care? Or is communication with the community most important so a project is most useful over the course of its life? When architects work in academia, they often feel a responsibility or are required to produce critical disciplinary knowledge. Yet few among this emerging generation of architects feel this is the most important responsibility they have related to communication today. Instead, many younger architects prioritize broader audiences. These architects are experimenting with representational types, methods for dialogue earlier in the process, and channels for dissemination that embrace and even leverage a more inclusive set of voices. They are talking to more people along the way to ensure that the project is economically, intellectually, and physically accessible to more people in the end. 
As cultural figures and mediators who operate across private and public realms, architects today actively construct identities that reflect broader societal circumstances as much as they anticipate and project change. Rather than privilege one side over the other, they seek legitimacy and influence in academia as much as they do in the global marketplace and the communities in which they work. Accruing cultural capital through relationships with respected institutions, as well as through engagement with local organizations, these architects understand their roles as stewards of the built environment that serves a wide variety of individuals, each with their own unique identities. Architects today pursue an extension of their own cultural, political, and social identities and values through their work. Those identities are synchronized with what is designed and how design performs in a variety of contexts. Many new architecture firms feel a sense of responsibility to build relationships based in trust so that a project truly supports the community it serves and contributes to positive change. But these efforts raise important questions. How does one even define the community of a project? Is it the group of people who live in or near a space an architect is designing or intervening in? Is it the group of people most affected by the project and affected in what sense? Is it the client? Does it include the individuals building the project, the labor that brings it to fruition? Does the architect belong to the community? New frameworks for talking to people affected by a project in earlier phases, post-occupancy surveys and analysis, and active attempts to define collaboratively what success means may ultimately atomize the understanding of expertise and account for voices and perspectives that have not been heard and considered previously. Uh, please bear, bear with me while I read this really long list. Automation, black life, chess sets, chewing gum, choreography, clip art, color blocking, computer science, economics, environmental justice, fashion, film, gabled roofs, garden parties, geometric primitives, grids, historical building types, money, music, neurodiversity, ocean floors, off-the-shelf materials, optical illusions, other architects, painting, parades, planetary scars, photography, politics, pop culture, public health, race, rituals of professional practice, rocks, storytelling, waste, water infrastructure, weaving, and violence. Like an endless image feed, sources of influence for architects today are as unintentionally varied and commonplace as they are deliberately coherent and obscure. The diverse inherited and chosen influences cited by architects today reveal a collective desire to be influential in an equally diverse range of contexts and for multiple audiences. Many new practices today are turning away from the high tech and machine driven and choosing off the shelf, local or inexpensive material and materials and processes. Their projects are built using conventional assembly systems with regular materials and typical details, but the designs are anything but conventional, regular or typical. These architects acknowledge the environmental impact of material extraction and waste, the economic and socio-political impact of labor systems, the expertise and intelligence of craft, and the power in partnering with a builder. This recognition sponsors an approach to construction that looks very little like approaches developed by previous generations. Doing more with less is a design and construction strategy that not only responds to in larger environmental and societal issues, but also makes a positive impact on the individuals involved in the project, including how a client lives their life or how a builder considers their craft. Buildings reflect, reflect and record the needs and desires of human civilizations, and in doing so are expressions of abilities, beliefs, power structures, and values. Equipped with and empowered by a collective belief that form is political and that aesthetic pursuits and activist agendas are not mutually exclusive, these individuals take on an entanglement of issues from climate change and environmental degradation to homelessness and racial injustice and are especially eager and prepared to demonstrate the value of the discipline of architecture and of architectural design. I think less so are we asking the question, what is architecture? Uh, and I think there's more interest in asking what can architecture do and what can architects do? By creating new economic models for practice, critically interrogating development, resisting environmentally insensitive construction methods, and engaging with local culture, architects today are confronting their capacity to act politically through increasing access to quality design and embracing their roles and as attendants of the urban realm. And finally, finance. 
Um, earning supplemental income and building an identity through academic positions has long been the norm for experimentally oriented critical thinkers and designers, and that remains true for today's emerging practices. But there are other modes of practice, business strategy, community nonprofits, architects working as developers, and new venues, gift shops, podcasts, co-ops, that these individuals are exploring that will open new territory for architects moving into the profession. More so than ever, it appears that many architects are exploring alternative manifestations of practice and business to develop projects that are equitable and value driven. Beyond the financial models that practices are using to sustain themselves, some are also working within and developing new models for how others can access architecture, most of which take the form of co-ownership. Co-op housing, community land trust development projects, and nonprofit community initiatives aim at addressing architecture's economic inaccessibility and find collective labor ownership structures that allow for more people to be involved, ensuring financial viability for architects and clients alike. Complementary to many of the other efforts we've discussed tonight, these efforts to rethink financialization in architecture challenge the status quo and sponsor a future for professional practice that distributes agency and opportunities for wealth creation beyond the privileged constituencies who previously held it in excess. So uh, all of that was the first 10% of the book. Um, and it sets up what we think is the more exciting part of the book, which is the conversations that we had uh, with 32 practices. Um, we hope that uh, what we just shared kind of sets the stage for that, but also for the conversation that we will have now, um, which I think we have quite a bit of time to let play out. We're, we're very grateful to Katie, Cam, and Anna for uh, accepting our invitation to lead the discussion. Uh, and we're equally grateful to Mariana, Kutan, Mirko, Ben, and Max for putting themselves on the hot seat. So we'll invite you all up to join us now, um, and we'll see how it plays out. We hope to have time for conversation and questions from all of you as well. Um, so I'll just kick us off with the first question here. 
Uh, Molly Cobb mentioned that the book aims at providing access to people who found ways to operate outside of conventional modes of practice for a variety of reasons. They're finding ways to practice that align with what is interesting and inspiring to them, as well as compatible with the lives they want to live. One of these ways, relevant to this conversation, <clears throat> includes supporting practice through teaching. Um, so we were just curious for each of the panelists to reflect briefly, or, or maybe if you've reflected within your practice or amongst yourselves as educators, um, on the framing of the book as kind of, in some ways, between two crises. The 2008 financial crisis, which provided um, a, a set of constraints on practice, and then um, we've been calling it the long 2020. Uh, <laughs> on the other end, which we, uh, we as students will be emerging into now. Um, I, I guess we're wondering, how do you see the stakes for students now being similar or different to the stakes um, maybe in the early days of your practice or coming out of education and specifically related to maybe the previous financial crisis? And do you see ways that the experience of your generation has impacted both the academy and the profession of architecture? <laughs> you have the mic. <laughs> I can't start off the conversation by projecting my thoughts onto your generation. Um, the question is, what do we see you guys facing as you venture off into? I, I think that's it, and how does it differ from, maybe, or, or where are the similarities? I mean, the, the book, I, I think it's a nice kind of book in many of the conversations in the book, but, um, you know, maybe. Well, from my, from my humble position, I'd say that uh, what is remarkable about your generation is that you guys are engaging the questions of practice from the very get-go. So you're, I think there are, maybe there's a less, there's a more clear-eyed approach to entering into um, graduate studies, understanding, trying to chart out what that path might be and that journey might be, so that you can anticipate what might be the next move, right? And what the risks, liabilities, costs, investments are that it, it are involved in that. Um, speaking for myself, I don't know if I'm speaking for my generation, but I think there was much, very much a kind of a uh, bright-eyed, romantic leap of faith into the profession. In fact, for me personally, I thought I would come out of architecture going back into a fine art practice and find myself stuck in this profession, right? fully engaged in this profession and, and this discipline. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's, that's the biggest difference that I, that, that is, um, that I see is um, a sort of amazing foresight that your generation has. I mean, it's 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 evidenced in the question that you just asked. But you pass it. I'm <laughs> um, I, I have a maybe uh, funny story that relates to this room. Um, I I was here as an exchange student in 2004. Um, 2004. Um, for like a week. Um, the workshop um, and many events like this through that we day, day ninety lectures, uh, great lectures, and uh, we call them home lecture as well. And at the end of it, uh, I think Mark Lee um, who asked me, um, "Do you want to teach?" Um, and it never occurred to me that was an option. I go back to I said, "No, I've got my own practice." Um, and that's kind of what I did. Um, so that, I, I think in some way, um, kind of what the book does in an interesting way is to kind of lay out in front of you many different ways in which one can uh, practice this discipline of ours. Um, it, it's really crucial because while there might be nuances and uh, maybe even big, big differences in generation of what the practice might be. Um, I feel the kind of practice one could take on, even back then, was a very expected. We all made conscious choices about not to be in a particular kind of firm, follow a certain kind of mentorship, um, and really focus on what we wanted to do. Right? So there's, uh, you could say there's always a drive. Uh, that drive is different for different people. Uh, that 
uh, kind of pushes you uh, in your circumstances towards different directions. How you determine those circumstances to be kind of like defining as a practice is probably the most important thing in any generation. Um, I was thinking, you use the word crisis. And when I first engaged the book, um, I thought that some of the themes that you outlined in the um, index, um, somehow my mind went to the word crisis too, right? Like, um, and I thought you were reading the 2020 crisis, but you know, I, I feel like I graduated in a crisis too. I graduated in the undergrad in a crisis, my grad studies I graduated in a crisis. Then, you know, we're teaching in a crisis. So I think there's always a crisis that we're writing and trying to figure out which brand of crisis architecture now needs to be a part of. Um, some brands that might be more challenging than others. So it's almost like you can see the crisis not in the world, right? Um, and so I think crisis can be an incredibly prolific context to produce. And even if I look at sort of certain schools, but certainly I was obsessed with one of the students, like the AA of Ali Moyarski or the Cooper Union of Ada, uh, there was definitely a moment where students also turned to drawings and uh, illustrators, illustrations and cipher speculation that while at the moment you know, it's not necessarily a clear path on how that would become the business environment, it certainly produced. I mean, the, some of the most important projects of the late 20th century and certainly from the beginning of the 21st century. So, you know, from the bad day, from like, this is that And then we try to figure out how. And say, my story entering education is perhaps the opposite of yours, because probably, I don't know if all, but most of the figures that I admire in architecture. Um, were also teachers. So it never occurred to me that I was not going to do that. And the relationship between how a pedagogical project and a project of practice uh, were somehow informing one another seemed so evident to me and so interesting as a kind of fertile um, binary or, or uh, collaboration. Um, and then maybe the last thing that I would say is that I know I don't remember if it was you when you presented that you used the word emerging practices. I just have the question of when one stops emerging <laughs> no, or being emerging. So, you know, there's one day when you were like, okay, I'm, you know, not that young anymore. But, uh, uh, but the thing with architecture and how um, a project at some point becomes a body of work uh, that does have aesthetic traces that you can articulate or other um, threads that become evidence. I, I don't know, maybe some people have the foresight to define that, but I think it's more like a retrospective exercise that you do at many, many points in your career, and then it emerges of the topic. So most of the practices that you showed while they're still young, by the moment you have your third project, either built or unbuilt, you can begin to see conversations. And I think there's some intelligence in how you build on that and create, create discourse. And Academia is such an incredible place to do that with students and people that can you know, prove the work. So, crisis, time, I don't know, seems to definitely resonate with me when I saw the, the book. Uh, or it's, it's funny to hear that uh, your characterization of that, Marianne, because it's for me it's very similar, but also opposite. I it, the, I approach practice with a naivety that, of course, everything that happens in research uh, will eventually end up in the built environment, very directly. And I blame this place in large part for that, and, and I actually believed it. Um, uh, and, and so I, I agree that, that inevitably there's an experiment. There's, and for me, this was the case, there's a, an emerging body of work, and then there's kind of an episodic rethink of what that all means, and a, a strong desire to attach a line and a story and a narrative and a vein of research that you then want to project forward to that. 
Um, only much later did it become evident that that um, the academy and that that research would be relevant in actually projecting that future line. That you can't simply interrogate the work in order to project a, to project a future. You need to speculate, and that this like this place, the academy is the place to do that. Um, so I'm completely dumbfounded by the idea that I think it's incredible that students are engaging this idea of practice with kind of the deliberate notion that those two should coexist. I find it incredibly thoughtful and ambitious, and I'm wholly in support of it. Um, but I approach it from this place of accident that I can't, I can't really even rationalize it or speak about it intelligently. Nor would I, let's say, start a practice and set out to write a mission statement that included, I must teach. Um, it, it's quite the opposite for me. So in any case, that's not really an answer, but it's maybe kind of a defense of an answer that we hear. <laughs> I want to maybe um, go back to the question because I, there was, for me, and maybe I misunderstood it, but was there a kind of um, underlying <coughs> implication that you, know, you guys kind of have their, your practices? Like, what do we do? You know, like with uh, students now, like we maybe want to practice, maybe not, but like, how do we do it? What should we do it? <laughs> um, and I can only, again, relate a little bit to Katan comments that. I don't think anybody knows when you're out of school like exactly what you are going to end up doing, right? Um, but one thing I would ever say is that um, hopefully while you're in school, you develop some kind of passion or obsession, whether it's formal, whether it's social, whether, whether it's um, uh, you know the kind of engagement with community and peers that somehow drives you forward. And that somehow enables you to then continue practice. And whether you want to call it practice or you want to call it whatever, whatever that is, I think that's perhaps the most, I don't know, that, that's the way I see you all kind of continuing, right? So I really don't know, like when you look at that 50 years, 100 years, like what were the practices then? You know, like they maybe the kind of store architect, but that type of practice that we are talking about today. Which is so multivalent, right, and encompassing almost everything. It seemed, looking back, it didn't. So I think you guys in 10, 20, 30 years, who knows? Like there might be something out there that we don't know about at all, right? Which is kind of exciting, to be honest, because I think like with this social media, with technology, with all the kind of communication, uh, you know, things that we have at our disposal, there's so much opportunity, and I feel like we are. We don't know, you know. So I think, like, my only um, I don't know advice, if that's what 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 what, what we can offer, is that uh, you need to remain hopeful um, and you need to remain kind of optimistic about the world. I think it's really really important because sometimes things are really difficult or can be difficult on the like, practice side, academic side, I mean, all of us know it, life side. <laughs> um, but the kind of optimism that architecture requires, and I truly believe that, like I don't, I really don't think that there is kind of space for aestheticism in architecture that will carry you forward. Um, and so anyway, that would be my, you know. Thank you. Okay. That teases pretty well up to our second question. Um, so Molly and Kyle opened the book uh, with the contextualization of emerging practice Right by a period of time, um, and specifically, you're thinking for this question about the period of time between the Trump presidency and the structural violence around 2016 to our long 2020, and to demonstrate a radical shift in the call for architects to address equality, accessibility, and sustainability on a scale that wasn't on the table previously. Um, and the following interviews in the book reveal the gap between architect architects who choose to address the radical shift through aesthetics and design, and those who do not. And when I ask all the panelists members, um, as a practice or a practitioner, how do you address this gap of aesthetics versus politics, um, either generally or the politics behind aesthetics? And based on that, who do you choose to work with, and who do you imagine your work is for? I need more time for that. <laughs> 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 
questions. Yeah, that's more like 10 questions. Yeah, that's what I guess. <laughs> um, I'll start with the. Uh, and the later part of the question, uh, who do you choose to work with? It seems that you grant so much power <laughs> to the architect as if he chooses <laughs> and then he chooses their kind, right? Um, and within that, uh, then chooses um, with the budget that somebody else gives you, uh, the consultants, um, the contractors, the workers, Etc. Etc. Right. Um, and uh, in, in any practicing architect will know how little agency you have in making this decision. Um, and that, that's something to recognize. Uh, then you can make a sense, right? Like I, I'm going to be someone who um, makes their own decision, um, decides everyone I engage with, and then the world begins to get really mad, and then. Problem becomes how do we bring the agency we have in terms of defining how this world looks and feels and appears to others to its maximum potential, yet have to contend in a way to participate with all aspects of this world that might include some ugly aspects of this world. Um, so the, the question in some ways is a little bit of an undertone of purity in how one engages the world. Um, and I find that to be an impossible position to be productive. Um, that doesn't mean the work cannot engage the world in a place. Um, I think in some way, um, I kind of always be the architect as perhaps uh, as kind of a double agent, um, somehow feeding potential new uh, politics to their work. Uh, into the world without necessarily, at least in our case, not necessarily uh, kind of claim uh, the work does this. Uh, we are kind of uh, expressing our politics out loud um, in front of the work, but somehow let the presence of the work do its thing. Um, so it's, um, it, it, I think, goes to kind of um, Kind of how we understand our role in the world uh, as as kind of political agents, whether um, we kind of uh, claim a power that we don't have and chase that. Thing. And I, I'm sure there are people who will say with me on this. Um, or um, we kind of claim we have all this power. We can all do this. We can resist. We can resist. I found in my experience of practice. For others, for ourselves, um, and not 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 participation is not a way forward. The political and positive um, kind of contribution in the world. I'll try to follow up on that a little bit. Um, I, I agree in, uh, with Bhutan uh, with what you're saying. Uh, I also and I. I'll have to defend this later, I'm sure, but I don't see architecture. I'll take care. <laughs> um, I don't see architecture as a political tool, um, and, and that's not uh, because I don't have a political agenda. I, I see um, architecture as kind of a, a, a collective enterprise that that you know, results in a political agenda or addresses the political agenda. I'm doing a terrible job of training this, but I'm going to try to fix it. Um, we had a conversation yesterday in the kind of warm-up round for this about collaboration, um, which was <clears throat> kind of on everybody's mind, mind right now. We talk about collaboration so much. And one of the participants uh, talked about collaborating with the clients, and I thought, Boy, that's really different from my experience because <laughs> I see that the clients as sort of a contaminant to what we do, actually, but a but a productive one. And I don't see that in a, as a negative thing. I just think it's productive. Um, so rather than using the term collaboration, I think maybe collective is better in that we I we I physic I see the physical thing the, the the stuff that we are trying to make the piece of architecture, the project, as the thing that binds 
kind of what I see as a, a sort of broad and disparate set of agendas that are often in conflict. When it works, the collective and the collaboration is the thing, it's democratic, that allows all of these diff disparate but overlapping agendas to cohere in a project. That's, to me, that is the, the political power of architecture. It can do that. Um, I think I'm being a little bit ambiguous, but hopefully some of it is making sense. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. Um, maybe adding my two cents to it. Uh, Dave Hickey has this lovely idea of, um, say, utopias versus gardens. And in a utopia, you're, it's, an, it's, it's a non-existent place, and you're trying to represent your project. You're evangelizing. You're in the mode of evangelizing. And you're trying to proselytize a kind of manifesto that says, this is the right way to live. This is the best way to live rather than tending to a garden and cultivating a delightful space that naturally people want to, you know, enter and, 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 and frolic with it, right? And so I think that's always the, the way we thought about the, how a kind of politics might operate in our work or we aspire to, is that it's not, um, in terms of its communication, it's not broadcasting how things should be. But hopefully, by proposing what it actually is, we can convince a few to join our side. So I think that's the way we think about it. You know, I and I, um, I actually remember, um, you know, when I was in school, um, and in my graduate, oh, and I don't know, I think nevertheless, um, you know, looking for. Uh, that um, I was, uh, you know, there was a kind of traveling scholarship uh, at a graduate school that you had to apply for by writing a proposal of what you wanted to pursue. And uh, me coming, you know, from um, from Slovakia, which at the time when I was born was kind of a socialist slash communist country. Anyway, the whole the whole proposal was about setting socialist housing in Slovakia. And, a kind of Eastern Bloc, um, and, and I really, truly really kind of, you know, believed at the time um, that, uh, you know, like this is this is this is the way to do things. Meaning, like the, the architecture could um, somehow mobilize things and somehow, um, um, how should I say? It? Anyway, in retrospect, looking at my proposal, and I reread it actually last year. Um, I was thinking to myself, wow, that's not me. Like, what, what was I thinking? Um, but where I'm going with it is that um, this was when, again, I came to America um, and realized that, um, you know, things that, oh, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to basically collect myself in, in a way that uh, makes sense to people. But, uh, I believe to be political, it's hard to do through architecture. I think uh, being political, uh, the, if you want to make a change, right, you do it by being active, by voting, by you know, really kind of organizing uh, yourself and or so forth. Um, I have somehow um, seen how things can go really down a slippery slope when architecture wants to be political. And so maybe I'm a, a little bit more cautious about that, you know. Um, and I always go back and forth between the kind of place where I came from and place where I am now. Um, and so I don't have um, I don't have a kind of strong position um, on, on that, but I do believe you can make a change. But it, I think like what Ben was maybe trying to say also at the time. Um, is that you're trying to do the best, right, and through hopefully the kind of work that you're engaging with, um, and you're putting out in the world, right, um, change may trickle down the line, right, and alliances may be forged, forged through that process, um, and I think uh, that's probably the best, um, at, at this point, I think that we can hope for, because it's extremely difficult to just say that a building can change the world. At the same time, I think that the collective process of practicing a 
and engage in the world and change the world. So I don't know if it makes sense. Like I was kind of convoluted, but um, you know. Um, um, I, I was thinking about so uh, where the response started and where the question sort of ended. This idea that again, uh, or the proposition that it's a decision, how we approach all of those things. And I would say, both for better or worse, one of the things that I know about architecture is the uh, complexities of how all the stakeholders, the context, and actually a lot of the themes that are outlined in the book don't exist in isolation. So I find that the most interesting architecture tends to be the one that not only resolves for sustainability or resolves for social agenda or resolves for access or resolves for finance or resolves for blah, 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 but that somehow manages to synthesize those different pressures uh, and still produce something that has sort of coherence and beauty. And so for me, what's again a challenge but where the skill of architecture enters uh, was um, definitely is in how we manage that complexity. So I think all of those things in isolation, whether it's just what it is or something else, when they're the only thing that a project is advancing, if it not if it doesn't recognize that there are other things that architecture must accomplish, it tends to be projects that fail dramatically in other areas, such that even an area that it was foregrounding might uh, fall short. So this is also implies, so maybe going back to where the sun started, that every project is a world, so it's hard to make those decisions a priori, while you might have sensibilities that cut across all projects or certain desires or projects that leave, uh, I think, through time in um, the years of the practice or an individual of putting architecture in the world. In a sense, that kind of constant shifting around the negotiation while challenging, I think it's incredibly uh, beautiful about architecture. So that's why going back to the crisis, you know, I'm sure there were other economic crises. I'm sure there were other uh, uh, moments of similarity. And then there's things that are dramatically new, like the new technologies or the extent that we reached the climate crisis now is unavoidable, impending, et cetera, et cetera. So there's maybe crisis and urgency can also be differentiated. And I know you were asking what we think your generation is entering. But I think certainly some uh, topics that were interesting, interesting to a few are now a concern of all. And they must be sort of contended, regardless of what your sensibilities are or your interests are. An architecture cannot afford to not engage. So maybe there are different topics, some that everybody must contend with, and others that come from our own interests and our own sensibilities that make up for that sort of style of things. But I think we have to fight for that power. It's absolutely true. You don't enter the room, and maybe this is very anecdotal, but when you talk with people in, um, outside of circles of architecture, it's hard to argue that we have real power. Although I do believe in the power of architecture once it exists in the world, uh, as, uh, um, as people that we sort of are constantly imagining the future and projecting, I think others operate very differently. We'll have to fight hard for that um, that place and reclaim territory that others don't see. It's for architecture. So yeah, I think it's really interesting when you're talking about this through the lens of like um, as a choice, and like each one of you obviously practices differently. But it sounds like you're on the same kind of spectrum in regards to the way that like you answered that question at least, and um, the constraints that were on you when you maybe started your practice. Well, I think they look like crisis is a great word, like they look really similar to the constraints. I think that um, like our generation is not even that different or you know that much further away from ten years ago, six years ago. They do look really different. And I actually don't 
yeah, like discussing it as if it's like a choice is just, I think, a really productive way to frame those constraints and think about and speculate towards the future and think about how what we do have choices um, as is like when we do want to build a practice or what our picture can actually speak for on its own. Um, but I think those constraints are an interesting way to segue into the third question, um, which is very positive um, <laughs> and it's easy, but it's also like deeply personal. Um, the same way that the constraints, the 2008 crisis, um, COVID, like I think affected all of us, like even affected our generation and students as designers, like um, pretty like instantly um, as well. Um, the book and the interviews mention frequently um, the array of influences that affect a lot of these decisions and the way that um, all of you are talking when you construct your practice. And so we were wondering um, if you could share more of the kinds of this um, and again, this is deeply personal, but I think really important in a time where amidst all these constraints, media, mediums are like evolving and collapsing on themselves in like a really complex and like faster pace than they ever have before. The point where our influences are not as, um, you know, there's no manifesto anymore, like there's no uh, digital fabrication, like that era is over. It's the point where we're all, our influences are very personal and they're very, I think, like undiscussed, like where we get those influences from um, and like what we choose to react to, and whether it's political or aesthetic. And so we were kind of wondering if you guys could share like what those were for you. And, in your own practice and the way you teach also, I think. <laughs> well, I think we know Mariana. As you mentioned, Cooper Union, right? Doing K Dog, <laughs> which I think we can easily share across across the board. Well, I do. Oh, I can start actually because. Um, uh, I mean, maybe there are like two um, influences. Influences. I understand what you're asking, but um, I also think of like influence as something that actually um, is almost like a one-way street. And I, I hope, you know, or I, I, I would like to think that all of these things that we are either bombarded by or choose to kind of look at mm -hmm. have the possibility to be a little bit more um, open-ended and kind of back and forth in a way. So, but one that I do want to mention, and because she was here, is Julia, or Julia Gamolina. I think the Madame Architect project that she started, for me, was amazing. I did every single interview there, and this was kind of uh, during, so for, I don't know if all of you know it or not, but it's basically a kind of platform uh, that a relatively recent architecture graduate started uh, as a means to really expand the conversation of what it means to practice also, and, and now really engage uh, within and outside of the discipline um, as, as, as a woman architect. That's how it started, at least originally, I remember, and she's really doing an amazing job to kind of opening up um, modes and ways of thinking, practicing, designing, being kind of artistic. Uh, with all the possibilities and pressures that uh, one might have when it comes to academia, practice, motherhood, you know, like all those things that, I mean, for me, what you're asking for personal, I'm going very personal, like I just had a, a baby recently, but I think knowing that there are actually people in the world around you that are going through the same things, I think she was more in a it's like I have always been there, right? So like knowing the kind of affinities uh, that are there, I think can be very productive because it kind of can, it keeps, you know, pushing you up and, and driving you forward. And so that's one. I, I always kind of look at look at that platform as something that is not a kind of visual uh, influence, but it's a really kind of mental influence. And I really appreciate that. Um, and the second one, uh, it's interesting, you know, it's, uh, I am a huge Instagram freak, and I know this is, but for me, it's, it's almost a kind of library that when I find something that is a little bit interesting 
potentially more aesthetically, I want to do a deep dive, and then I always want to kind of find out, like, who is the new artist, or what are they doing? So it allows me to actually kind of not just scroll through, but really enter potentially platforms or, you know, media that I was not aware of. Um, and I know that maybe something um, that is closer to, to you all, um, I don't know how many of you are still going to library to trip through books, which I also love yeah. to do. We do, you do great. <laughs> because that was, you know, I love doing that. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Um, so, um, but that's, that's, you know, the kind of like, if you're asking for personal, like, I'm going really personal. Um, so, and Kyle, maybe I'll come back to this. And Kyle, oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> like, no? <laughs> uh, I, I guess mine is sort of a no-brainer. Everybody knows, knows me in the room I've said this before, but I'm just always looking to history. I'm like, always, I don't know, manifesto is strong. I don't know if it's possible to have a manifesto. I'm also a suspect of the word because I think it implies a certainty and I'm really suspect of things that are so certain, especially right now, politically. So if anyone presents a manifesto, my first inkling is to undermine that manifesto. It's a, almost a knee-jerk reaction. Um, so I would say I'm always looking to support a current project uh, with history. Um, I would, and I would say I would love to do the inverse, which is I would love to project kind of a, a, a current project onto like an object of history or back onto a historic context, but I've never been able to successfully do that. I think there's other practices that do that much better. Yeah, and like the manifesto, it's like also not just as like a political artifact, but like as an object of itself. Like there's a meaning that is more like where. Oh. I'm not going to talk about me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think there are two very different kind of influences uh, in the way um, I could see my development um, as an architect um, and then maybe as a teacher. Um, I was a uh, uh, Riser student um, at school. Um, was deeply influenced um, and, and shifted fundamentally uh, how I looked at architecture. Uh, then I worked uh, uh, in their office with uh, Nana Tomamoto, uh, who really schooled me. Really, um, so, in, in a way, they're kind of combined influence uh, in terms of how to approach learning. Um, and how to approach learning and practice. Um, I remember at, at the end of my time in the office, I said to myself, I'm not going to do it. Like, I'm not going to do it the way they do it. It was exhausting. Uh, it was um, kind of draining, incredibly rewarding. And after 15 years, I find myself practicing Exactly the same way. Um, exhausting. Shoot, you're not supposed to see that. No, it's, it's real. Um, and everything I said, I would do it differently. I find myself doing exactly the same. Um, so for, for that reason, I have to kind of say like that the deep influence in the way it um, kind of framed the way I look at design, architecture, um, just at large. Um, the other one is the community around you. That includes, I think, um, I would say, all my colleagues here. Um, they're kind of recent uh, transplants here. Um, and the way I teach change, uh, the way I think about um, kind of the discipline, the way I think about practice architecture, teach architecture, it will change because of the colleagues and students around us, and every school has a like. Um, so I think those are the contexts in, in which one finds themselves, like a very specific in a practice, or a kind of larger community of um, this generous exchange between generations, you as new generations, uh, that keep us all people, you know, 
uh, with uh, new ideas and new pressures. You are, you are old. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I think that kind of uh, exchange keeps us on our toes. Um, and that's kind of the wonderful thing about uh, being able to kind of take what's brewing here, go out and practice, bring what's brewed there into academia, and have that feedback loop. Uh, and um, let that influence the interpreted um, I am super crucial. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I say that it's also most important, most broadly, um, and then I guess uh, specifically, so um, I similarly was very influenced by some of my teachers and um, I was thinking, um, maybe because we are here, how we bring the question of influence to our teaching. And I was thinking, like, I already started teaching a really long time ago. And I use a lot of cultural references when I teach, or historical references, music, art, uh, a lot. And there was a moment where the age distance between myself and my students was very little. So we actually believed in the same cultural context. And now, you know, we keep getting older, still you know, becoming at the same age. So that distance increases. And some of those cultural references are not shared words anymore. And uh, I do not have to, um, in fact, I give that to my teachers. I also had access to that toolbox of those that were older. So this idea of influence, I think it always looks back, it looks forward, and it also represents a section of a blending time. I think what you just said about your peers is so true. Even um, kind of myself in different institutions, the conversations change, that reflects the work, uh, and obviously the, the, the value is still incredibly important because they ask different questions and obviously uh, different moments in time. And then more broadly, I'm, I'm happy to hear you guys go to the library. I don't mean in a bad way, because I think now we all consume information differently and we produce information differently. Um, I know I use a lot of architecture when I was a lot of people I got going to be and looking at the other things. So uh, not necessarily a drawing of people. And I think that I, I can sort of see a cultural shift and I think there's no one better model than another, they just bring different sort of dimensions uh, to the work. And there are certain mediums that lend themselves better to be experimental, like the drawing or the media or the representation. Uh, and then the built the environment has other challenges and when you see something that tra is transformative, you go like, wow, that's really hard to do. Right? And that, that capacity is sort of embedded in the sort of skill thing that you're having. So for me, again, going back to architecture, and I think it brought pretty sort of strongly forward the word transdisciplinarity, which is different than interdisciplinary or um, uh, collaboration, uh, that it, I think, implies that it's not so much somebody uniquely foregrounding your own area of expertise and then letting others bring something to the table, but somehow transdisciplinarity implies generating at least the base knowledge in which you're also knowledgeable so you can establish the terms of the conversation, which is harder to do. But it comes back to, I think, something that we've been talking about in different ways, which is the architect as a specialist versus the architect as a generalist. And, uh, and I, and I think we're both, but not many disciplines necessarily can claim uh, that. And everybody practices in a different way. So we do have expertise, and our expertise is very clear, but I think there's forms of engagement that require us to be um, quite knowledgeable about other things. <laughs> and that goes back to what we look at and, what we, and who we learn from and what we bring back, bring back to the project. So I think the topic of influence is very present in the school, and you know, not that precedence is a new thing, but influence is also different than precedent, and the many ways in which that enters the pedagogical project in a way that they would affect who you are uh, as designers. I just think broadly as a topic, it's like incredibly competitive, and one of those things that just keeps changing with time, and each generation brings something new. 
I always ask my students to share on their Spotify, uh, you know, like my channel. So it's like, what are they listening? Or my kids, that's also have like an incredible, amazing taste in music. But it is a little bit like that. Like, what is mobilizing culture for each generation? I think you begin to understand things that you see in the world. I was a little bit sad to hear that you don't discuss that. Like, uh, you said that you don't necessarily uh, put that across. I think it's just more of like a deeply personal thing that like in an age of like overwhelming information and overwhelming forms of media and mediums through which we are I'm not talking about our consumption, but like the ability to curate those, where those influences come from is like just a deeply personal thing. But it's not like, oh, I, I studied, I went to Riser and I, now it informs the way I teach and the way I practice. Um, it's, and I think it's the reason that like it's so great that this book exists and like all these different practices are are analyzed and shown because I think in even two years there'll be like 135 or 35 videos. Like yeah, and I think it's just increasingly complex and not in a confusing or bad way, but in a different way. Yeah, but it is a curation. Yeah, it's a curation that everybody has. So yeah. That's a big more for it. Oh, you're coming. No, it's coming here. Wait. Sales, deliveries. We're a class of boys together. So I'll just piggyback on these. No, I'll answer. I, I will definitely answer this question differently than everybody else on the panel because I think seven or eight years ago I made a very conscious decision to not operate in the world as a designer and I fully committed to being an educator and now as an administrator I think I operate you know, very differently. And, um, but undoubtedly this place was incredibly influential and inspirational and life changing and uh, we were a little bit uncertain about how it was going to go when we came out here. And, um, uh, and this has been a wonderful conversation, and by no means this is meant to kind of wrap things up, but this is a very special place, and tonight has proven that that continues to be the case, and I, I hope that all of the students are able to recognize in real time the opportunities that they're presented with, and um, trust that they will continue to have a, a positive, lasting influence. As a student here, I think I had lofty uh, aspirations. I wanted to be as good of a designer as Neil was. I wanted to be as good of a critic as Michael Speaks was. Um, and I, I looked to people to think like that's completed at a level that I would like to operate as. I quickly learned I was not going to be as good of a designer as Neil. Um, and now in my role I, I really look to our team, Michael Speaks, who talked here when I was a student here, as, as being uh, incredibly influential as an administrator, and I think of my project as running a school. But that, to me, is very much a project. It's incredibly complex. I'm sure they know it. Um, and that comes with different sets of inspiration and, and influence, and I'm, I'm deeply influenced by our students. It's been impactful to work with the three of you this week to just get a sense of like what's on your mind, what are you talking about at UCLA. Um, and our students uh, come with a a wealth of diverse lived experience and values and for me in this curatorial project as an associate dean and as an administrator to learn from them and to understand how that how we can better position them and you to do things better and faster than, than we were trying to do. Um, and I think Mariana hinted at it, but it's a privilege to work with people that are as passionate about their course of study and to attempt to accelerate the the, the positive ways in which they can contribute to the world. It's, uh, it's been incredibly influential to just work, be with our students and spend time with them. Um, yeah, I, I came to UCLA and um, I think fully like drank the Kool-Aid. Like I was, I was super uncritical of anything happening here. I loved all of it. And because she started as the um, chair the same year I started my first year, so it was like it was like Hitoshi's project. And every lecture he brought in, like the first year our lecture series was Pacific Rim. And lots of Japanese designers came in and I felt I, I, I didn't recognize it at the time, but later I recognized how influential that had been on my design, um, just how I approached design. 
like still to this day, when Greg and I design something, we think about like how would insert name of Japanese, like how would Fujimoto do this project? Like what would you know or whatever? And um, that was I didn't recognize exactly how that um, how how like my training like I felt like such a product of the training here, but I didn't recognize that until a little bit out of school. And then I was interested in adulterating that. Like how can I take this this like what I just this, I was obsessed with this training this design training that we've gotten here. Um, and but how could I like enrich that with something that would that would be really weird and different? Um, and so the choices I made of like jobs I would have, or you know, I went into teaching really quickly, um, getting a fellowship at UIC um, with Bob Sommel as the director. The student work that I was seeing there was like so different than what I had been exposed to here. Not even really interested in it. Like, what is going on here? What is this? And that was interesting because I was like, well, how can that rub up against my training and maybe enrich something, do something different? And I think that um, the the projects that we've done, the now I'm like, you know, we've been designing projects, building sort of small public interventions um, and public space projects, and now we're starting to get involved in larger scale like urban redevelopment projects in which we're playing a much smaller role and thinking more about like larger policies um, engaging with mayors initiatives and um, how uh, how kind of like city government um, funding and designers and artists kind of connect across that, like how, how that loop can be tightened to allow for really good design to come to the same place where funding is and where mayors understand the value of those things, right? And so that also is like a new thing that, you know, we've engaged with as designers, but we're not on the, we're not working on the policy side, right? And so how can how can like we start to dabble in that and connect those things um, in ways that can <coughs> get more good design to the places it needs to be? And so I'm always thinking about it as like, yeah, what can like what can mess with what I've been doing in a way that could could offer a richer territory? And to me, that that keeps me interested, right? It keeps me like um, it keeps me wanting to do more and seeing what's next. I'm going back to the first question where you're talking about the academics um, and, and how you know we're all operating in the academy. I think working with students for me is directly tied to that. Like it it keeps me really curious and interested um, because it's always pushing new boundaries. Like they're teaching me constantly new things. Um, it could be like cultural references as well as how they're designing things they're interested in, etc. But it keeps you questioning where you're not um, falling into like this is what I do and this is how I do it. But there's always like new curiosities that come up, and I would imagine that's true of everyone who teaches. That's like it's such an engaging and fulfilling part of that. Um, but I just wanted to mention that I didn't recognize any of this when I was a student, right? It like took a little ways out where I started to see, oh, oh, I was trained in a very particular way. And now, like, what can I do with that, or how can I um, augment that um, in a way that, uh, yeah, like, um, can complement um, uh, my values and sort of ways I want to live my life? Great. Yeah, I think we will prioritize your questions if you guys are. Oh, the okay. Oh, I'll just I'll just say that um, to kind of piggyback on what Kyle was saying, and and maybe also just to, to underscore the difference in, in the, the generational differences in um, um, you know how we enter into this place, right? Contextualizing it to UCLA, I mean. I absolutely, absolutely knew I wanted to do grad school here because of the cast of characters who were teaching here, and many of them are sitting in the audience tonight. Like I wanted to learn from these people because they were doing incredible things that I had saw in print in Beijing when I was doing a residency there, and was like, "What the hell is this? I didn't know architecture could look like this." 
And so it was, it was very, very, it was very legible to me at that historical moment that there was something distinct here um, being provided. And if you zoomed out, you could say, okay, maybe it was happening at seven or eight different institutions globally. Like this is, these are the kinds of uh, distributed uh, allegiances that were working on this thing, right? And, and, but I don't think that exists anymore. That kind of paradigmatic difference that's immediately recognizable is, is, doesn't, doesn't quite happen in that same way, whether it's through because of media network communication, the instantaneity of things, and the kind of radical uh, you know, atomization right, that, that we're talking about. So it, you know, and, and similar to what Molly's saying, it's also you come out of that that pressure cooker and then you have to figure out a way to you know kill your fathers right to, to, to use a child. um and, and so then, then it's a lot of work on how, how do you begin to to define your own yourself and, and yourself as an author as a designer etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think maybe that's a problem that you guys won't necessarily have that you can actually cultivate a more nuanced sort of eclectic mix of influences that not to say that you're not here for particular people, but it may it's 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 more it's weighted in a different way than it was, I think, at least in you know the we were talking about generations earlier prior to this talk, right? Uh, elderly millennial or 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 young, <laughs> young, young Gen X, I don't know, Zenial. Um, but you know, it, and also th this is not to say that generational differences exist and align according to age, right? Because we're all here sitting in this room. So these generational proclivities are things that we're all contributing to and all participating in. So the atomization that you guys are immersed in is something that clearly we feel, right? And I think, uh, I mean, to, to Kyle's, uh, to, to attribute to Kyle is his previous book, Possible Mediums, I think was really a kind of moment in American architectural publications that said, oh, you can identify a group of designers based on their plurality, right? That, it, 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 that there could be a collective formation that's marked by difference, not by sameness. And I thought that was super interesting. Right, that maybe they caught a lot of flack for at the time, but now with some historical difference, that's very obvious. And I think that's a kind of legacy that you guys are uh, inheriting now. Okay, and I know we're not supposed to double dip, and I promise I can do this in five seconds, but I want to provoke a student question, actually, because I just want to go back to that Kutan statement, which I thought was actually really profound and something that I hope people stick on to, because we just talked about curating influence, optimism, the range of things that are available to you as a generation, to everybody now currently. Kutan, uh, for me, struck a chord when, when you said, um, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but we're also kind of unwilling or uh, victims of our own influences too, right? Here I am 15 years later doing exactly what I said I wouldn't do. That's something really important to take with you going forward. It's not on your minds now, but as you get to year seven out of school, you should be looking back at that and year 14 again and again and again. And that's it's super important. I hope there's a question around it because I think it also marks, a, a, I think, a paradigm shift in how we practice as it relates to the entire topic. Um, okay, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, maybe starting with the question first. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I wanted to call back to the former part of Anna's question, which kind of um, Drew the line between aesthetics and politics. Um, I recognize in the latter half of the question, the, the consensus was that architects don't necessarily have the choice of how we uh, instigate our politics within the practice. I do agree with. Um, but I feel like 
where an architect's autonomy um, kind of lays in is um, the aesthetics that they put forward in design. So as educators, I, I'm wondering like how your personal aesthetics as architectural practitioners um, informs your pedagogies, which uh, operate within the politics of the academy. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, since I haven't, um, it's different, I would say, in practice and teaching. Um, you know, like in some way, um, this is perhaps a kind of pedagogical uh, question as well, in the sense you could have teachers who teach you what they do as they do, right? Um, and there's something to learn from that. Um, you know, um, there are people who stand by that. Um, and there's something to be gained in terms of what technique that might be, uh, maybe a range of aesthetics that might be specific to that technique. Um, and um, for me, um, I, I think um, it's always been kind of moving away uh, from that. I find it more interesting uh, in some way students not doing my project, but somehow arguing for their aesthetics within the kind of uh, scope that they establish uh, in a course, and, uh, studio or whatnot. Uh, I found that to be more interesting because it begins to second guess what I do, um, and maybe look at questions from um, the hybridity of other perspectives. Um, so I, I think, um, Maybe going back to the question, I don't see it as a binary, um, like aesthetics versus politics. Um, aesthetics is politics. Uh, it finds its expression, um, you know, uh, very clearly. It's visceral. Uh, it's not something we talk about. But it enhances it, and we do it in through various media. Um, and architecture has that potential and complement challenge in terms of uh, how it mediates. Um, I, just to kind of maybe going back to the question again, uh, sometimes the mediation becomes so indirect in terms of a political ambition um, that architect, architecture proves to be sufficient in its capacity to change the world in an immediate project. Think about the way in which our roles of politics have shifted in the last six years. And we build a four story building after five years. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, there, there is kind of a realism within that that's kind of hard to kind of come to and uh, 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 But there is always kind of potential in the life of a building in terms of what we aspire for it to do and shift to aesthetics to let people imagine reality in other means, other ways of architecture. That's where I think the agency of architecture lies. In the way it engages politics. Yeah. He may be more interested to hear from your own faculty and the a little bit, but um, you know, I think like I wasn't totally surprised to hear how all of these folks answered the question initially, knowing all of your practices. <clears throat> um, in in the book, we have people who are more. Um, like overtly uh, addressing political issues, and they're doing so in, in a variety of ways. And so I would invite you to like see how they talk about it. One of the ones that was really particularly interesting to me was um, we interviewed Elisa Aturbe, who has a very environmentally focused project um, that she calls called Carbon Form. Is interested in the term form being being included there, right? Because previously, and I don't think this is the case anymore, like Kyle and I were very talking to the students earlier, like we don't see that the, the division that I think students see a lot between like aesthetics or form and politics, like there's there's not really that division, but it does seem like it, and it, it previously did to me as well. And so I wanted to pose that to Elisa, like 
like can you tell me about the use of that word form in, in your in your um, in that that uh, the way that you talk about it. Um, and so, you know, she's really engaged with like, well, things have form. We we are bringing them into form. And so, if we're not dealing with form, then then we're not actually like doing doing the work, right? And so, it can it can do multiple things. It can have that that goal, but also be engaging with form, with aesthetics, etc. Um, and so, that was I think an important thing to, to for for her to deal with, but also for for those of you that are that are feeling like that's a, a binary that they're sort of mutually exclusive um, to understand that they're they're really not. I would also say, like, I don't build buildings, I don't design buildings. Um, I work in the public realm, do small kind of urban interventions in public spaces, um, and politics or like uh, kind of political engagement is very much a part of every single project. Um, and yet, we really like color, we like form, and we like, you know, squiggly things, and, and like, again, those aren't mutually exclusive, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and we can, you know, we can talk with our clients who care very much about certain community engagement efforts and um, engaging with stakeholders in a particular way and the way that programming might unfold over the lifespan of a project. We can also talk with them about like which color we're using and why and how we think this, you know. So those things, um, I would just like, I want to sort of prompt you guys to think about the opportunities. Like it's, it feels to me, the question feels to me like we are political. We want to have an impact and that's awesome. I think you can have those, um, those uh, inclinations and desires and goals and design with that in mind and those designs can can like do more because of that. Um, so those those yeah they're just not mutually exclusive. You don't have to choose one or the other. Yeah. Um, I think the question is more about like is it conscious in the political in the pedagogy that like to what you were saying that um aesthetics and more are political um in that like like, like you know, in this whole setting. Yeah, yeah. Does that come through within, you know, the academy? I think that was my question. So I'm trying to think how I would answer that question and sort of an individual decision or to the main collective interactions uh, that you might have different students, different students, different peers. I love only that you work out the issue of forms because I think not in the distant past, but it's definitely a reaction against form. It was difficult to talk about form, and I was like trying to understand what that generation of students, which is not your generation of students, meant by it. And you know, a cube is a form, and you have other forms that are more exuberant. And I think that reaction against formalism was more associated with a very specific aesthetic, with a very specific moment in time that was very much associated with it, an economic and a political condition that also had aesthetics attached to it. And the need to reclaim form as an essential tool of architecture uh, and connect it to your own agency and political project, I think without it, I think it would be very hard to operate in the world as an architect without consciously learning how to use form as a device, uh, particularly if you want to operate by building things. And whether those things are installations or buildings, I think it's the same. Uh, or even if your position as an architect comes as a project instigator, you will still have to engage and evaluate the form that has a school on the table for you. So also an answer to about what we just said, perhaps different pedagogical models. I think the model of apprenticeship, where you learn under somebody by perhaps making their process and their output, is very much alive and kicking in other places of the world. Maybe I see less in the United States more and more. Um, versus trying to help the students develop the tools uh, uh, to produce their own, let's say, these are projects and interests and sort of skills uh, that are obviously aided by the knowledge that we are interacting with. So in trying to answer very directly your question, I think um, part of it is embedded 
in brief some syllabi in the kind of references. Correct, we talked about influence that we might offer, but it's very much, I think, transformed by your own sensibilities, whether well declared or not. Um, and that appears in everything you draw. So maybe my own anecdote is that uh, my transformational practice experience was definitely working um, at Saha's office. And there was this moment after I left where everything I drew looked like a Saha project. And A, because I loved it, and B, because that's what I've been doing for the past years, right? And, uh, and in conversation with uh, my partner, Simon, that was also in the office, we were like, we don't want to do a project that looks the same, even though in many ways we have a lot of pride in being part of that project and the things we learned that were aesthetic but not just aesthetic. They were political but not just political. They were formal but not just formal. Uh, so this is where, you know, there's also a little bit of work, some that is conscious and some that is unconscious. And I want to say something that sounds like a cliche, but I think you're always learning. I know you come here supposedly to learn from us, and you do, and hopefully you do, but I think there's really like a process of exchange that is the signature of creative practices in that world, you know, in a sense, when we start a project, at top of it, we don't know where it's going to end, right? We offer beginnings, and those beginnings come with sometimes biases and sometimes references, but then the rest is very much process. So it's not that it's not declared, it's almost like I feel like you're looking for a definite answer, but I think it's a lot more dynamic and <coughs> collaborative and malleable, even if we have agendas <coughs> of our own and again a history that each one of us brings and foregrounds um, to our teaching but then each context somehow changes it. But I would say, now circling back to form, I'm very relieved that form is back on the table as a productive conversation and not a, you know, we don't talk about form. Thank you. Oh, go buy books. Was that the answer? Yeah. Maybe somebody else will Maybe somebody else will Guys, thanks for giving us a lot of like hearing guys talk about this by our future. And um, it's always fun to hear you guys talk about this kind of stuff. I got a question, a comment that you made on that about just kind of. It was a small part of your answer, but it was talking about how buildings can come public once or architectural projects have more public influence once they're built. And given that we deal with a lot of unbuilt projects, and as someone who doesn't grow up in like an architect household, I didn't know that's how complex that was in the world of architecture. Um, and Learning to enjoy it, how they guide worlds. Like, I know in this new mega structure, sounds like so many of those are unbuilt, and there's so such richness in those projects. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, how do you, how do you guys think balance some of the how to, I guess, the rest of the world once they're built, and balance how influential unbuilt stuff is? Within our like pedagogical profession, precedence, but maybe that doesn't get all the way to like the public, except indirectly. And I know like the more I learn about art, and I start to see like more connection to reference to other things that aren't necessarily what I knew about and what I see in that individual I knew about when it's not been faithful with the I 
I'll take a two second stab at that. There, for me, there is no balance. It's just, it's the same. There's a project that has multiple potential outcomes. Um, maybe some of those are more predictable, others aren't. It starts, it matures, it dies, it wakes up again. I, I just would say that it's not a conversation about one or the other, it's everything all the time. Well, I find it a question really interesting, Alexander, and if I'm understanding more correctly, it's also, if I translate it simply in my head, it's like, you know, we are looking at references or precedents that have never been built, and they're, we, we talk about them as well, they're so important for you, you know, others could care less about them, why? You know, um, I mean, this is a kind of really simplified version of this, but it, it's kind of an interesting question because I think maybe it goes a little bit to what you guys were talking about, which there was a quote about beginnings or how to begin. And I think, um, you know, we, every project we always start, you guys in studio or in seminars, or we, you know, outside of studio seminars, but for, for a client or not, there's a beginning. And that beginning has to do with many things, whether it's a kind of, uh, outside constraints that are a little bit kind of imposed upon you, or maybe something that is internalized, right, and pushes that jump starts that project. And I would just say that maybe that's, um, that's where the difference is, meaning that some of the work that have never been built, right, may not uh, be registered within kind of larger public, but they have a huge kind of impact right, within the discipline because they have the ability or have had the ability to kind of jumpstart other projects or to, to kind of open up beginnings, right, for others um, and to open up conversation for others, right? And so and that's maybe because of, and not going to medium specificity or anything, but, you know, the drawings and the ability of us as architects reading drawings and or images, right, um, is something that we are kind of trained to do. And that's the kind of language that we are developing and you know, building upon. Um, and so I think that's the kind of beautiful thing about architecture in that way, right, that we have, their, we have our language that both extends and projects outward into the world, but it's also something that is ours. And ideally, and hopefully, you know, we're kind of, as you're in school, and as we are, I'm still learning, right, that like you're kind of discovering all these words, so to speak, right, that like how others have done it in the past, how could I tweak it, how could I transcend it in some way, it's what inspires me, like I'm always obsessed, as you probably mostly know, all big plans, plan drawings of any kind. When I find something that has been done 2,000 years ago or 20 years ago or yesterday, it has somehow a potential to like jumpstart myself as a designer. You know, that's, I think, maybe that's a difference, you know, where like for somebody else, you know, like, why is this interesting? I don't know. So, anyway, that will send my take on the question. Yeah, I think yeah. we probably need to wrap up. <laughs> we wanted to say on the title and all our panelists um, not only for having this discussion and facilitating the production of this book, um, but also for wanting to include us um, in developing these conversations and pushing them in, in a little bit of a either critical lens or a hopeful lens. Um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.